Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to take a little trip. We're going to take a little bit of a trip back in time and also a trip about 6,000 miles around the world. We're going to do a little bit of walking. There's a wonderful, wonderful story that I came across that talks about someone who actually had a dream or, well, actually rather a nightmare, if you will. And it's kind of one of those that we tend to explore to find out what is its meaning. A particular dream where you might find yourself all at once just naked, nude perhaps, without any clothes, standing around in public with people surrounding you wondering, what in the heck am I going to do now? Well, this is what happened to our specific guest who's joining us here on the program today as she first found herself at the age of 19 in a place known as Tehran, Iran in 1975, where she would spend approximately about a year living outside of the country with nothing less than obsessive-compulsive disorder. She's joining us here on the program today to talk about how this particular trip changed her outlook on life and the wonderful way things would unfold for her. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Miss Anne Craig Cinnamon. Anne, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Daniel. You know, I appreciate it. It's pretty interesting when I was looking at your bio, the fact that you had spent more than 30 years in the broadcasting industry, and you think obsessive-compulsive disorder. Now, isn't that what Jack Nicholson had as and as good as it gets? And how would somebody go into something like that, first of all? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, that is what he had to an extreme. Um, obviously, his behavior uh, exhibited itself in... in um, antisocial sort of ways, and mine is more of an, of an internal thing. Um, my family is aware, anybody who lives with me is aware um, that I have habits and things that I do that um, um, are not normal, probably. Um, not probably, they're not. Um, mm. But it's more of an internal thing. It's a, it's a counting thing. It's a checking thing. And if you were around me, um, you know, just... Uh, to meet me or whatever, you'd have no idea. At least I hope you'd have no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of travel and some of those kind of things, I find that I get very um, stressed, nervous. Before trips, before something like Iran, I would have a major uh, trigger on something like that. Um, but I have not in my whole life allowed it to stop me from doing the things that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, some people do, you know, you, you, they stay in their home. There's a, a, a wonderful book um, that Steve Martin wrote um, called The Pleasure of My Company. And it's a, actually about a, a man who can't leave his house uh, except under some very rigid conditions. He can't walk across the street. He can't step on, on certain stones or, or whatever. I mean, he set up rigid guidelines in his life that he has to live by. And otherwise, he, you know, he counts the ceiling tiles at night, and he has to count them in a certain way. There's mm-hmm. things that he does. It's a wonderful book. It's very warm and empathetic, and, and I cried when I read it because I'm not in any way that extreme, but I know, what, you know what's going on in the guy's head. Mm-hmm. And so uh, for me, I, I would not allow that to stop me. For a, this character, he would barely leave his home. And mine, I think I almost um, probably forced myself further. I think maybe I, I went beyond my, way beyond my boundaries to overcompensate for it. I mean, how many people uh, take on a, uh, a marriage after uh, I dated my husband for four months before we got married, and two days later, I moved to Iran. I lived there for a year and a half. And, you know, how many people do that period, let alone with OCD? And I, and I really, in analyzing it 30 years later, I think I did it as an over, overcompensation kind of of thing that proving to myself that I can do anything I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and the thing is, as a person reads this book, and is maybe at first, and again, I don't have any first-hand experience with what it is like to be with someone who is obsessive-compulsive. Okay, uh, again, my experience, uh, of course, would be from a movie like As Good as It Gets. Oh, that's what it is, and eventually, you know, that's how movies turn out. What's interesting, though, as you said in the beginning of the conversation, is that unless you live around me. Now, when it comes to autism, of course, in my experience, that's a different story altogether. And I can assure the listening audience it's not as lovable as it was portrayed in the movie Rain Man. (laughs) 
Right. <laughs> so, you know, again, you know, you're looking at, and of course you're seeing the, the, the slight daily irritations of, of what it is like to live around someone like that, at that extreme as well. But like you said, until you're around it day in and day out, it isn't as romantic as a movie lets you believe that it is after an hour and a half or two or three hours, you know, because it's every day. And then you right. think about how you were dealing with this. Of course, as you start off, you know, in the beginning of the book, and you kind of lead us into the world a little bit as you're off in college. You know, you were glad that your room was by the stairwell and that you had, you know, X amount of this and that, and, you know, to be able to get to class. And there was this rigid thinking, and even the roommate was beginning to have some trouble here with you. And I thought, now just imagine if it's like this, you know, then all of a sudden you find yourself in another country halfway around the world. And as you write about this, it seems that it kind of falls away and becomes a background thing, you know, that you have this going on with you. But what's interesting is that as you continue to read and eventually you finish the book is that somehow it sneaks up and it grabs you from underneath the skin and you realize, well, you can see it feel it and sense it almost afterwards, almost like seeing your shadow after somebody points it out to you. Oh, this is what it is. It would have been a very subtle thing that you wouldn't have noticed unless you were around you as much as, say, for instance, your husband. Right. It it really it is things like um, turning light switches off and on. Mm-hmm. Or having to do, it, or faucets. I mean, that's a, a real common thing. Um, if you've read anything about OCD, and it isn't always. It's it's a lot of times. It's when I'm under stress, or there's a trigger for it. Um, and and again, I'm not nearly as bad as as something you know, like as good as it gets. That's a character that is so badly OCD that he he cannot function as a normal human being. He's like a He's like a pariah. He's a very mm-hmm. antisocial and and um, uh, that kind of thing. Whereas with me, it's more of a coping. It's a control thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I just recently wrote an article about it, and I and I think as a child, I was so frightened um, by my room and by the fact that there was this this basement stairs right next to me, and there was an iron downstairs, and I was always afraid it was plugged in and. So what I would do is I would go through a checking routine every night, and it had to be the same routine in the same order, and if it wasn't, I had to start over. And I would go downstairs, and I'd make sure that the iron was unplugged, and I'd have to check it a couple of times. Once wasn't enough. And then finally when I felt like everything was safe, and I'm, I'm talking a small, pretty young child here, mm-hmm. then I could go to sleep. And I did that. I don't really know how long I did it. That's, it's been so long ago, and I was so young. I don't remember for what period of time I did it, but it went on for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And I think that was my way of controlling a situation that is not controllable. I was frightened of something. I didn't know what it was I was frightened of. But if I did things in a certain way, I could control my fear, and everything seemed like it was okay, and then I could sleep. Well, the problem with that is, obviously, if you think it's working for you in one situation, you're doing it at night, and you wake up the next morning, and everything's okay, and you're, you're still alive, and, and you're, you have a pretty good day, and all, well, you think it's working for you. <laughs> so what do you do? You actually take that then, and you apply it to other parts of your life. Mm-hmm. And I think, it's, I think it's very easy to analyze how it came to be in me, I think, uh, first of all, from what I've read, it can be genetic. And my my parents were very particular. Everything had to be just so. And, you know, you don't put your feet on the couch, and you don't do this, and you don't do that. Everything was very particular. I think there could have been some OCD there. And me, I took mine to more of an extreme than them by having routines and checking and whatever. But the checking gave me comfort. Mm -hmm. And because it worked, or I thought it worked and on some level for me, I continued it, and it grew to other things until now it's a part of me. And I'm, and I'm not, I don't check behind anything, I, I, but I do check, you know, I'll check the coffee maker before I leave the house, and I might check it twice. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll check a door several times. I will, I don't know that I can close a, a drawer anymore without doing it a couple of times, and not, not 
badly that anybody would notice, but it's in my head. i got to open and close that drawer again. Mm -hmm. And it's not a thing that I'm going, all right, I have to go do this. It's just become intrinsic. It's just what mm -hmm. I do. And, again, I think if you, if you live with me, you know. If you don't, you, you would probably have no idea whatsoever. People that have read my book, people that I've talked to since then because I'm kind of coming out as OCD now, <laughs> people are, are like amazed. <laughs> it's like, really? And you're, you're afraid? Because, you know, I had a 30-year career in broadcasting, and you don't have a career like that and have a great deal of fear, although I understand Barbara Streisand throws up every time before she goes on stage. You know, people do have fear and still are, are public figures and speak and sing and perform. Still, overall, in a career like I've had, you don't have a great deal of fear and still continue to do it or, or function well at it. And so, you know, um, for me, it, it, it is a very internal thing. Mm -hmm. I have to, I count certain things, or I, I write it a certain way. I might dot my eye a couple of times, you know? Mm -hmm. Once is not enough, <laughs> I think, is, is kind of the way I sum it up for me. And I've learned to live with it. I've learned to deal with it. And I've never taken anything for it. There is medication. There's therapy. I've chosen not to do that because I didn't even know what it was until I was probably well into my 30s. I had no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. And now, I, I found... I, you know, when I learned, it was like, wow, there's a name for this. Ah. Wow. <laughs> now that I know what it is, I don't feel as abnormal as I thought I once did. <laughs> exactly. See, yeah, you just put your finger right on it. I mean, I think when we think we're alone and we're very strange and, and we can't explain our own behaviors, we feel so much worse about it. And then when you realize, wow, um, you know, this is actually fairly common. One in 100 people, from what I've read, mm -hmm. suffered to some degree. So it is rather common, and it exhibits itself in different ways. I think uh, Howie Mandel is a germaphobe. That's that's sort of a um, a form of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of people who have. Well, he was also, like uh, uh, as I understand, too, with attention deficit disorder as well. Ha, huh, yeah. yeah, and I've not really, I've not had that. Uh, mm -hmm. Although I think the older I get, the worse I get. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I look at the it. day and age with society, with all the messages we have around us over and over and over again. It's amazing that probably more of us don't have attention deficit disorder because Absolutely. you take a look at YouTube, for instance. Uh, you know, that's one of the largest, if not the single largest, search area that people go to, and they suggest that if you're going to produce a video, try not to make it more than five minutes long. I mean, that's how right. driven to distraction we all are. It's a, a conditioned response that's actually been created. And even though I've even explored this question a few times here on the program, let's say through the work of like a Dr. Bruce Lipton and his biology of belief, is to take a look at perhaps genetically we're becoming more inclined in this direction so that we can shut this down. You know, And it's pretty interesting when you look at it from that perspective. Uh, but, you know, back to uh, to you, it's it's fascinating that you took what you had uh, going on with yourself. You were able to kind of pull it in and have the courage to step out. And you've reached all seven continents, more than 70 countries, and visited all 50 states. Well, gee whiz, you know, that must have taken a lot of energy for you to be able to do with the circumstances of how you had to be in life. I would say less than, than you would think. I think more. mine is more of a build-up towards uh, something. Once I'm there, I so mm -hmm. enjoy myself. Okay. I, I've had fear of flying. I've had fear of, I mean, not nothing that would keep me off a plane, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I do have um, a certain amount of anxiety about things, and that's part of what OCD is. It's an anxiety disorder. And so I do get a lot of um, anxiety over things that mm -hmm. I'm not in control of, and even some things I am in control of. But it's just one of those things for me. It's like I am not going to let this stop me from living a full life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to not get on a plane because it, I'm, I'm fearful of it um, when I want so badly to see the rest of the world, you know. And it, it's a... It's, uh, it's a major passion for me to to see it, and and again, it's it, I think some of it is overcompensating. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I will not limit myself. Mm -hmm. And if there's any message that I am trying to 
uh, put forth in my book. It's that. It's that, you know, I've had things in my head that I've dealt with and, and all for my whole life. And the the one thing I, I will not do is allow that to control who I am and what I've done. And I, I, I my my thing is embrace life, you know, mm-hmm. grab life. Do everything you want to do, as long as it's not harmful in some way. You know, we don't know what's coming next. Mm-hmm. So embrace life, and and uh, despite any kind of uh, problems or disorders or whatever that you may have, do not let it stop you, because this is mm-hmm. maybe the only chance you get. We certainly have the opportunity to hear the same piece of advice from Peter Folk just before he really had the uh, onset of Alzheimer's. Uh, We had a chance to get him actually about a year and a half just before that had happened. And he says, you know, my advice is just one more thing. Just go out and do it. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. And there it is. I I watched my mother um, get so ill and and become an invalid, and I got the traveling bug from my parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they traveled a great deal, and, and when she got sick, they couldn't. And I watched that, and I thought, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm going to see everything I possibly can, do everything I possibly can. Um, we're going to go running with the bulls in July. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's part of that's part of my thing too, is experiences, not just seeing countries, but experiences. And uh, I'm going to do all of those that I possibly can while I still can. You mm-hmm. don't know how how much longer you can you're going to be able to you know even walk. Mm-hmm. Something can happen, you know, let alone run. So I, uh, I that is that is part of of my message. If I have one, it is do what you can while you can. Now the title of your book, Walking Naked in Tehran, was exactly just that. You had a dream, if you will, or a nightmare, as you said. It was actually a couple of times, and it terrified you. Tell us about that. Uh, actually, it started while I was in Tehran, mm-hmm. and I would uh, I'd be walking down a major boulevard. There are some very large boulevards in, in Tehran. And I'd be walking down this boulevard, and people would start staring at me. And, and I would get stared at anyway. I, I didn't wear a veil or a shador, although I would say half of women at that time in Tehran did not. In, in Tehran didn't. Um, but they quite often would wear a scarf or something, and, and I didn't. And, I, and I'm obviously Western, and so I would get stared at. And I didn't always dress, dress as conservatively as I should. And so I'd get stared at, but and I didn't like it. Obviously, I didn't want to call attention to myself. So I would be walking down the street, and people are staring and pointing, and I look down, and I'm naked. And I try to get into um, a business uh, building or whatever, and people won't let me in. Mm-hmm. And so then I wake up, and I'm pretty much in a cold sweat. And I had that throughout my year and a half in, in Tehran, and I had it for probably many years after I returned home, I would still wake up in that cold sweat, and I'm naked in the middle mm-hmm. of Tehran. And, it, you know, I've in in my uh, my work on air, I've done a bunch of interviews with dream analysts and that kind of thing. And, and you know, you can analyze those things all day long, but generally naked is, uh, they say, is, is showing vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that it was my my way of, of being very afraid, vulnerable um, in, a, in, an, uh, in an environment that I certainly found very, very foreign, very foreign culture. And it, you know, it obviously scared me. Mm-hmm. Um, not sure I knew who I was, and that's another thing they say. Naked is sometimes um, shows that, um, you know, that you, you are maybe afraid to let people see who you really are. Mm-hmm. Well, I was 19 years old. I didn't know who I was then. I had no idea who I was. So I think there's a lot of different things you can draw from it, but the main thing I drew from it was that I was scared. Right. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much scared me. <laughs> yeah, I found that fun to read, uh, the idea of, of course, how you not, you know came to have the title of the book as such. Because I was remembering at a time back in the 1980s where I myself and the dream briefly was, there I was outside, and there was a garbage truck, and there was a black man. He was kind of muscular and seemingly really all Mr. Natural to the level that he was naked, and he was picking up garbage cans and putting them into the garbage truck, you know, naked, no shoes, no anything. 
yeah. and he did it with such a matter of factness that it was like he was very used to doing this, and you right. got the sense that he had little to almost no education, but then at the same time, I realized I'm standing out here naked too. Ah. And so my thought was, well, I guess if it's okay with him, it should be okay with me. And I've had other dreams where that had happened, where you're out in public and you realize you have no clothes. And the first impulse you have, of course, is how do I cover myself? And then something inside me would kind of come out and say, just relax, you know. Mm -hmm. And there it is. But, of course, I've also been a lucid dreamer since I was about six to seven years old. So eventually I started working with it. And that's another story altogether. But the fact that you have the courage or you've mustered up to go to Tehran, it's 1975. You know, it's a whole new world, the willingness to be able to pull all that in and have the courage. You know, there's a small assumption you could make that, here you're walking in Tehran naked, at least in the dream state, saying, I have the confidence to be in this world or at least muster it up to at least try it. And That's here very I am. That's very interesting. I had not thought of it as a, as a positive thing, mm-hmm. not least. Uh, yeah, dream analysts can be a little so nuts, too. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. Maybe I was, kind of like, mm-hmm. here I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's but because of the societal possible taboos of, let's say, in the United yeah. States, you just don't run around that way because you can get a ticket or go to jail. So Right, right. Well, and, and there, of course, uh, women covered up. So there you go. Is the absolute opposite of, of what you would be expected to mm-hmm. appear in public as. So mm-hmm. um, that was, I think, part of it as well. Now let's talk about Tehran and Iran. Now you were there at a time that it would just be a few short later years later that the Shah of Iran would find himself in exile coming to the United States for asylum, you know. Then we know what happened during the Carter administration, and things really got ugly, of course, until Ronald Reagan came in, and then, you know, that changed a lot of things there. But 1975 to 19, just past 1976, as I understand, what was the country like then? It was getting more and more westernized, which Mm -hmm. was Shaw's influence. He was a a secular uh, monarch, and... That's why I think you saw more and more women without shadors, which is what they call their their um, veils. Their uh, they they mostly did not cover completely, not like you see in Afghanistan with burqas and that kind of thing. Um, so you'd see less and less of that. I, I think there was a, a lot more emphasis on education, and certainly women were working more and uh, going to school. And I I, I know that he. Uh, made some comments that were kind of anti anti woman and I remember the uh the empress was uh, uh very upset with him at one point because he didn't mm-hmm. make like an anti woman slam and uh but overall she and she was uh, very um, very attractive very uh positive force for women in her country because she was very very attractive outgoing um uh, personable and that and that kind of thing, and very good, I think, for women in general. Um, but of course, um, there were those that were not happy about the Shah being uh, in power, and and you know, if you um, believe that the CIA installed him and all of that, that's what I understand. Since then, I didn't know it then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they uh, managed to to revolt and uh, become, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, Ayatollah coming back and, and that sort of thing, that changed, obviously, uh, not just uh, how they are with the rest of the world or America and their relationship with us, but certainly changed, uh, I think, a lot of things for, for women and, uh, and freedom for, for people in general. I, I made quite a few friends of uh, Iranians while I was there, and I have so wondered what happened to them because they... Um, I, I I think uh, they were very well educated and that kind of thing, and and I'm not sure what happened to 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 people like that who wanted to obviously associate with Westerners and and all once uh, once the revolution happened. But mm-hmm. uh, I did have friends who were evacuated out uh, during uh, before the um, embassy was taken, 
uh, the embassy was right around the corner, basically, from, from where we lived. From our wow. Apartment. I, used to walk, I used to walk by the embassy all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And But I, I never saw, and I actually wrote an article about this, uh, because Argo, of course, won the Best Picture Award this year, and um, I never saw rioting or or I had things happen to me that probably were more about me being a woman than being Western, um, but I never saw any kind of uh, militants or any, any violence or anything like that. And in fact, I would say Iranians in general uh, really liked Americans. Um, I'll give you an example of one of my favorite stories from when I was there. Um, uh, the phone rang one day in our apartment, and, and the phone didn't ring very often because who did I really know? You know? And it was uh, I answered, and it was a man speaking Farsi. And I uh, told him, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I speak English. And he tried to speak English. He didn't speak m- not a lot. I mean, enough to I could understand a little bit of what he was trying to say. Well, as it turns out, he actually had called the wrong number and got me. But when he found out that I was American, he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to learn English, learn about America. And so at the end of the conversation, uh, which didn't last too long, he actually asked me if he could call again. And, you know, would you do that now, post, post 9-11? <laughs> and, and I don't like think that. you'd do that no. anywhere regardless of no. 9-11 these days. <laughs> exactly. That's right. You just you wouldn't. And uh, because I can find you now, but I didn't even, I didn't mm. even give it a thought. I said, sure, you know, I was lonely and, and uh, didn't know very many people. And I went, okay, sure. And I didn't know if he called back, but he did. And, in fact, he called on a regular basis and finally invited my husband and me out to dinner, which we went. And this man was just, you know, this older, um, hugely handsome, uh, very nice Iranian man that we became friends with. We had him to our apartment for dinner, and we became friends. And it was just such an interesting uh, way to to, uh, make friends, certainly. But the point was he wanted to talk to me because I was American. And I got lots of that while I was there. They mm-hmm. liked Americans. They wanted to know more about America and liked it. And mm-hmm. I think that that is still the case. I really do. I, I think the, the regime in, in power is not necessarily um, the uh, does not necessarily totally fit the the feel of the average certainly person in Tehran or educated person mm-hmm. in Tehran. I, I can tell you unequivocally too, Anne, is that we have actually featured uh, programs over. Uh, it was actually more on the beginning, but uh, over the last seven to eight years, where we have had people who have traveled extensively to the Middle East and especially Iraq and Iran, and unequivocally they say the same things over and over again. They say, first of all. The United States or the people of the United States really have a very skewed and extremely inaccurate view of the feelings of people, of just common everyday people in these countries. Uh, they do, in fact, love Americans and even, in, in a lot of cases, the American way of life, the feeling of freedom. What they don't like is how our government has went about sort of detaining these people and sort of denying them of what really when you think of the resources that these countries produce, really is their birthright in many ways. And you see how we as a country, and you know, unbeknownst to a lot of U.S. citizens, have exploited these same things in countries around the world, and the frustration that it must leave a place knowing that you're being basically you know, kind of left in the situation you're in. And one of the interesting things that you talk about in Tehran is your experience in realizing all the comforts that we enjoy here in the United States that we take for granted that you just didn't have available to you, especially at a time when you have a 13-inch black and white television. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah, I had nothing. I didn't even have an electric piano. <laughs> I remember it was the Persian rug was the best thing you had yeah. in the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we didn't have we, we had nothing to mm-hmm. you know except some some uh, brown uh, furniture and you know nothing really to even um, furnish our apartment with. We used trunks and everything, but we did have a Persian carpet. We did buy that. So 
But, uh, yeah, I had no, certainly there was no Internet at the time and no cell phones and, and nothing like that. In order to uh, talk to people back at home, uh, which there was a seven-and-a-half-hour difference, and, yes, that's true, there was a half-hour difference with Iran for some reason. Never did figure that one out. But we would actually have to make a reservation to make a phone call, and usually we do it in the middle of the night and that kind of thing. So there was no just picking up the phone and calling my mom, you know, or something. You, there was none of that. And so um, the uh, – and no Internet, so you weren't communicating that way – uh, television, we had the small, as you mentioned, 13-inch black and white TV that we would crowd around in the evening and uh, watch uh, the only English that was on TV. And that was for like a couple of hours a night. And so we'd watch reruns of, you know, uh, Star Trek and, and whatever. And uh, But during the day, they would have American TV on, but it would be in Farsi. So it was always amusing to watch uh, Lucy and Ethel speak Farsi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of funny. I found but, it funny, um, too, when you were talking about the fact that you finally bared down to, I guess, eventually enjoy Star Trek, but you never became a Trekkie. And I got a <laughs> kick out of the story that you shared how years later you had actually met William Shatner, or Captain Kirk, at a horse yeah. event. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, he was, well, he's big into horses, and he was uh, here in Indianapolis for a Boy Scout event or something, I think, and we were, I was in radio at the time, and we were asked to host the event, so I was actually on the stage with him, uh, and but didn't get to actually meet him because they kind of bring him out after we're there, and then he hopped on his horse and, and took off, and so when the event was over, he was kind of hanging around, and we chased him down, and he was literally almost running from us, and we right. got him back in some sort of paddock area with all the horses, and he had nowhere to go. We had him cornered. Mm -hmm. And so I do actually have a picture of him, and I'm looking like, you know, I'm really proud of myself with a big grin on my face, and mm -hmm. he's got the, <laughs> he's kind of a little, uh, looks like he's a little uh, out of breath, you know, because we've chased him down. But I yeah, found that funny, myself. Ann, because it almost sounded like an Ellen DeGeneres joke. Yes, and I met, and I took a picture with William Shatner. Well, actually, what had happened is, is I actually chased him down, and we corralled him. And so he had nowhere exactly. to go, and that's when we snapped the picture, you know. <laughs> exactly, that's right. But, but I did actually enjoy Star Trek. I had never seen the show before mm -hmm. I left uh, the U.S., and, and it was one of the shows that they, that they actually ran in English. Mm -hmm. So I got into it because of that, because it was, you know, what are your mm -hmm. choices? Yeah, but, funny, uh, but but we didn't have also didn't have a car, so we had to use uh, taxis and other public transportation like the small cabs that you would share, which that was an experience in itself. And uh, we had no uh, washer and dryer. I actually washed all our clothes in a bathtub for wow. a year and a half. I washed washed them in a bathtub and hung them out on our on our uh, our little uh, balcony area to dry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about the modern conveniences that you had to go without, of course, you said you didn't have a dishwasher. Your oven was propane-powered, which we'll get into that in a minute. And even with the lack of all those kitchen inconveniences that you didn't have, the one thing that you absolutely couldn't live without was the idea that all of your silverware was jumbled together. <laughs> so then, of course, you plead to your mom, who solves the problem, and you discover just how good Americans have it with the postal system. Tell us Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. Um, I did complain. I, I Something came up in some. We used to actually record on cassette. Um, instead of writing letters, we would actually record some things. And I think at some point in a conversation, we're talking about, you know, the silverware and, and uh, that, you know, they're all, all jumbled up in the drawer or whatever. And so my mom, who was you mention anything and she was going to rush out and take care of it so she goes out and buys one of those rubber made things that you put in the drawer to, that separates all your silverware mm -hmm. and she she packaged it all up and she mailed it well first of all i don't remember exactly how long it took but it was easily a month before it arrived and they didn't deliver packages to our apartment we had to go pick it up we got a note <laughs> so we went all the way down to the post office which was nowhere near us we had to get a couple of cabs and, you know, and all of this to get all the way down there. We get down there and we find that it's not necessarily open and you can't read. And we couldn't read the sign, but it was one of those things where, 
you know, sometimes it's open and sometimes it's not. They might have mm-hmm. been on a siesta or whatever. So we hung, and they opened, and we went in and stood in long lines to pick it up. And, you know, you are got in the wrong line, and we had to get over in another line. And it took forever to get this package. They finally found the package, brought it out, and it was all beat up. It was. It looked like mm-hmm. a Mack truck had run over it. So we opened it up, you know, took it home, opened it up, and it was. Uh, it, it's rubber, you know, rubber made. So we were able to kind of like make it work, and and uh, so that made my life so much better because I could separate my silverware. So maybe it's an OCD thing again. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know about that. You just never know. You want something that reminds you that you can have some sense of organization and order. <laughs> Something, yes, and, and a, a little reminder of home, and it was mm-hmm. nice to get it. I, you know, my mother had sent me something, and so from that then on, when we told them what a problem it was, everything they sent was uh, had to be in an envelope so that it would actually be delivered to the apartment. It uh. still took forever, but, you know, that was my only trip to the post office in Tehran, and uh, never had to go back again, thank goodness, because that was just one of those situations that just, you know, a hot, enclosed uh, building. I mean, when we complain about the, the U.S. Postal Service, you, you have no idea what the rest of the world is like. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're sure, you're waiting in a line in a U.S. post office, but inevitably you're going to get what you're there for. You know, right. when you decide to wait in line here at least in your circumstance in a Tehran post office, first of all, you wait forever only to discover that you were in the wrong line in the first place, whether or yeah. not that when you get on the right line, whether they're going to do anything about it uh, anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Funny stuff. Now, uh, one thing that really struck me, too, because I remember having this experience uh, for the first time when I was in Spain, is uh, that also, again, for people who really haven't traveled too much outside of the United States, we have a tendency here in the United States, at least in most places, that our roads are set up on a grid system, you know, that they overlap sort of in squares and cross each other. And what I liked is what you said is that in Tehran, they have roads that really don't seem to lead anywhere. And (laughs) I found that funny because when I was in Spain, what I noticed is, their roads, and I even seen this in some places in Italy, but Spain was where it really stood out for me, is that you could be going down a street or a road, and then you come to a point where you can either go left or right in a, in a Y split. So you mm-hmm. go, okay, well, I can go ahead, and I'll go ahead and go to the left, for instance. Then you're going right. down for a little bit further, and it does the same thing again, and you start to realize, wait a minute, m- you know, maybe they cross each other at some point, but they keep splitting off into Ys. You're right. like, why do they do this? <laughs> yeah, why do they do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think other countries just, uh, well, first of all, they're older. Mm. And, uh, for instance... Uh, you don't see a lot of traffic jams either. <laughs> no, you don't see you don't see as many, I guess. But right. um, we've driven several countries, and, and uh, for instance, Italy. You know, you're, you're in the middle of um, a city like Florence, and the road goes away. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this was built really in the Middle Ages. It's a, you know, Renaissance road or something right. meant, for, meant for horses and carriages and, mm-hmm. and whatever. And here you are trying to drive your, your little car, and all of a sudden it becomes an alley. And, you know, it's like, where did the road go? And so, yeah, that's another thing that we don't appreciate necessarily because we've got chuck holes and we all complain like crazy. But in other parts of the world... Uh, a lot of the the roads are it's not just in bad shape they're they're like almost non-existent mm-hmm. and you know go go to Ireland and there are no street addresses you can't find where you're going mm-hmm. you, know? <laughs> you literally have to have it described to you where you're going because you can't find a street address mm-hmm. and um and and the 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 thing though that I would say it sounds like a complaint I find it part of the adventure I mean I love that stuff Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be hard while you're going through it, but it's like you are you are you are experiencing this like like they do. You are mm-hmm. experiencing something that you don't experience here necessarily, and and it's part of the adventure. Getting lost can be kind of exciting in a way, and we've been lost in some of the best places in the world. 
And you also find, too, as you were living in Tehran, that there was uh, some other little things that became very big things after a while. And I was reminded of my time that I had spent in the United States Navy, and you'd be out to sea. Uh, you know, at first it's great, then day two, then day three, then day four, and then pretty soon you're at day 18 and you're out to sea. And you right. realize something as simple as a bird or a fish gets you excited because you're seeing anything other than the sky and the ocean and, of course, the people that you're on board ship with. And in your case, because Tehran is so hot and it's so dry and it's sunny and it's like that every single day, seeing trees or even flowers, was the same way as a sailor out at sea, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, I, where I was in Tehran, um, I'm sure that there would be Iranians that would um, argue with me, but I did not find Tehran to be very pretty. It was, it was not a pretty city, and there weren't, certainly where I was, there weren't many, many parks. You know, I'd, I'd walk the street, and if I walked by like a courtyard that had flowers or something, I'd stop and and breathe it in for a while because I just didn't see that kind of thing there. Uh, while we were there, we went to India, and I actually found India to be beautiful. I mean, we stayed mm-hmm. in this really nice hotel that had a garden that was all around us. We, we had a, uh, a nice uh, balcony that we'd walk out, and you'd have all of these uh, uh, peacocks and all that were walking around the grounds, and it was just beautiful. It was like paradise. Mm-hmm. And compared certainly to where I where I was in in Iran, and and um, maybe some of it was that we did um, so live in almost a uh, austere nature, even though our apartment was nice and it was not in a bad area or anything. We didn't go out of our way to buy a lot of stuff or make it feel like it was really home. Like I said, we used trunks for end tables and and bedside tables and. And, and that kind of thing. And, and so we didn't buy a lot of furniture. We didn't have a car to get around comfortably in, although driving in Tehran was something else. I mean, I would not have wanted to drive there for mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we didn't make it a comfortable environment as much as I would today. And part of it was because I was so young and didn't really know. And, 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 part, and the other part was that we were there to save a lot of money put money away so you can go home and do the things you want to do at home. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had, a, I had a purpose that why we were there. And, um, and I did work. I worked, and, and we could pretty much live off of mine. And, and um, my husband's salary pretty much all went home. And so, you know, it worked out very well that way. But because of it, we didn't ex- exactly live an extravagant life. It was, it was pretty austere. And I, and I think that's a lot of of why I felt the way I felt, too. I mean, I, would I do it the same way that I did it back then? No. I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I didn't appreciate where I was. I didn't see a lot of the historical sites. I am so into major archaeological sites in the world now. I mean, you name one, and I've probably been there. I love mm-hmm. it. There is, I've never met a ruin I didn't love. And yet I, I was in Iran for a year and a half, and I didn't see any archaeological sites there. Mm-hmm. I closed my mind off to enjoying anything about it, uh, because I, I really was not happy to be there. I didn't enjoy my, my time there. Um, and I don't know if I would today. I mean, I, I don't know that, um, I don't, I don't know that uh, I, I've, I've heard that Americans are still welcome and that uh, I have thought about going back. I would like very much to go back. So I don't know that I, I mean, just for a visit, <laughs> not mm-hmm. to say, just for a visit, but you know, I, I'm sure that if I were to go back in any country, anywhere, I would do it differently than I did then. Mm-hmm. But at 19, you know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't what, know anything at 19, really. Walking Naked in Tehran is the book. I'm talking with Anne Craig Cinnamon as she shares the first year and a half that she spends in Tehran at the age of 19. Now, Anne, you were talking about how you were there to save money and, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, build some sort of wealth, if you will, to come back and live the way you wanted to in the United States. And one of those wonderful uh, wealth-building opportunities came in the form of a gorgeous George. Uh, What uh, happened there? Are are you talking about my uh, Encyclopedia Britannica? Exactly. Oh, come on. Uh, You can't tell me you couldn't remember George as soon as I said his name. Who could forget such a guy? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was quite a character. 
Um, yeah, I had worked for Bell Helicopter. That's who my, my husband worked for. That's why we went over. And I had worked for them as a secretary for some amount of time, and, and I think I found I was not maybe a very good secretary. <laughs> I was kind of bored with it, and and we weren't going to stay any longer. We had the option of re-upping, and we had decided, and, and that's another whole story, but we decided not to stay. And so um, I actually started looking for another job, and I found an ad in the paper, and I went to this place, which was very close to our apartment, and I'm um, sitting in some sort of session uh, with a whole bunch of other people. Some were Iranian, some were you know, from other parts of the, of the world, and we're all sitting there about this job, and this guy comes in, and he's, he, he's, uh, he is the probably slickest salesman I've ever met in my life. And mm-hmm. you know, he sold Encyclopedia Britannicas, and uh, pretty much a door-to-door kind of guy, and he was like their big, big huge salesman in the, in the Middle East for Encyclopedia Britannica. He opened this office and needed salesmen. He also had this language learning system, which probably back then in its day was uh, sort of technologically advanced. It was a, a, a system that you'd listen to the tapes and, you know, whatever. And and I'm sure that uh, it's the same kind of thing that uh, along the same lines that they have today. Um, mm-hmm. But it was, uh, it was new. And so he decided that I would be great selling it. And I'm sure it was because I was this young American, and he figured that uh, I'm going to go to businesses, and those are mostly run by uh, men, and they're going to absolutely want to let me in to try to sell this thing to them. And to a certain degree, it kind of worked. I did sell uh, quite a few, as a matter of fact, and made some friends that way, made one in particular very good friend um, doing it. But... uh, it, uh, he was just probably one of the wildest characters I've ever known in my life. Mm-hmm. Just to give you one sample of a day with him. First of all, he was always hitting on me. And he, um, he, would, uh, he wanted uh, to always have lunch. And so this one day, uh, we went out to lunch. At, it was like the Russian tea room in Iran, in Tehran. And he, um, showed, he showed me how to do shots. You know, it was, it was the, the lemon salt. Uh, vodka shot thing, um, right. and I, of course, you know, I'm still only like 20 years old then, and here I wouldn't even have been able to legally drink, but, you know, I'm sitting there doing shots with him at lunchtime, so we did that, and then go out and get in his car, BMW convertible, and it was a hot, horribly hot day, and he's just done several shots, and here he is driving, <laughs> so we're driving in the middle of Tehran, and we're at one of these circle kind of things, and there's this this guy out with a with a hose cleaning off the sidewalk, which they're known to do. You know, they get out and they hose it all down because it's all dusty and everything. And mm-hmm. and so um, he pulls up and he uh, talks to the guy. He could speak Farsi, and so he's talking to the guy. And the next thing you know, he's handed the guy some money, and the guy turns the hose on us inside the car. He it was so hot that he wanted this guy to hose us down, sitting in his BMW convertible, and uh, just wild, wacky stuff like that. And uh, he was quite an experience. He mm-hmm. uh, and he still owes me money, by the way. <laughs> he never paid me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I came to understand as you talk about it in the book. <laughs> now, another experience that you had too is uh, sometimes there's an exotic e- appeal, I guess, to people, uh, perhaps in the United States and the outside world of shopping and. Talk about bazaars and what that was like over there. Bazaars are bizarre. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, well named. They are a little bitty. They they might be a, a big store with a door. You never know. And air conditioning. And you know those are the plum spots. Or it might be just a little stall that somebody has set up shop in. And it could be anything from maybe it's copper or brass or something to Persian carpets to fabric of some sort or just anything you can imagine. Um, and in, in Tehran, it was, a, it was a very large bazaar on the south side of town. And uh, I only went a couple of times. And one time we, we went with a bunch of friends. And, um, and it was, uh, and I've been to many bazaars around the world. Istanbul is, is very nice. Um, Egypt's is hugely interesting. Cairo's um, bazaar is very interesting. Um, and, and Tehran's, I would say, I, I don't find nearly as, as interesting as, as other ones. Um, but 
we uh, we did wind up uh, doing a little bargaining. I mean, you had to do the bargaining and mm-hmm. and uh, bought a few things. But uh, it was uh, it's an experience you have to have. If you go to the Middle East, you have to go mm-hmm. to a bazaar. You just you have to. It, you, it's hard to describe all the the smells and the and the and the sights and um, uh, the uh, just the crowded feel because it's usually narrow little passageways that that you're you're literally bumping up against people as you're going from place to place and mm-hmm. don't ever pick anything up unless you want the shopkeeper's full attention mm-hmm. for you know all the way out the door because if you pick it up he thinks you want to buy it right and he <laughs> follow you all the way down the street if he has to to get you to buy it and that's just the way it is and it's and it's fascinating um, it tires you out. It used to just, you know, now when I go, it just wears me out because it's like, you know what, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to bargain with you. I live in America, and I've done well, and I have a wonderful life, and I've got everything. Why in the world would I want to come over here and visit your country that I find fascinating, and I, wanted, and I want to try to rob you of, you know, a couple right. of right. just, for the, just for the fun of it, the sport of it? I mean, if, if they priced it, priced it too high, then there's no way I'm going to pay it. That's one thing. But, you know, there, I have so gotten away from wanting to do that. It's like, oh, my gosh, if you want you want uh, the equivalent of $10 for this and, and I'm willing to pay it, I'm not going to try to get you down to 8 mm-hmm. There's no point in that, you know. We've, yeah, you know, bargaining that, certainly seems to have a certain level of romanticism until you actually find you're doing it every day and all yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then it loses its allure real fast. <laughs> it's a <laughs> toothbrush fast. for Christ's sake here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and, you know, and literally you cannot pick anything up. You can't even stand and look at something for long mm-hmm. because they, they want to sell it to you then. Mm-hmm. And so you find yourself almost uh, after a while being rude because, you know, I'm not going to buy that. I don't want that. I'm right. sorry I looked at it, you right. know. And uh, and that's the other thing, you know, you I want – Anything, if I have another message about travel, it's that I really, you know, um, I so wish Americans would be kind in <laughs> when they travel. I don't think we always are. I think we do tend to think that it's a sport and that kind of thing. And and uh, uh, and something that, that I do uh, advocate is giving back when you travel, and that is something else that... Um, I uh, just recently had an article on uh, Huffington Post about um, when you're in places like that that are very poverty-stricken, there are things you can do. When we went to Kenya, we did a fundraiser before we went. We took um, uh, clothing, medical supplies, and money to an orphanage in Nairobi. And um, when we were in Cambodia, we bought a well. It was only $200, $200, bucks, and we bought a well for uh, four or five families in this in this poverty uh, stricken area that was given land that was given to them by the government to live on, and uh, they had no wells. They, people died because they have no fresh water. Mm-hmm. And so uh, these are things that that I do advocate. We do uh, speak um, about travel and that kind of thing, and and I do advocate that if you're going to travel, maybe think about it before you go and see if there isn't um, some sort of an organization or or whatever that you could you could go and and um, Donate. I mean, there's volunteerism is a is a huge mm. industry, but you can do it on your own. You don't necessarily have to go on a group tour with a with a company that specifically does that. There are things you can do on your own. Yeah, we've actually featured that on our program in different uh-huh. ways. We call it traveling tourism, or excuse me, working tourism, and then traveling volunteerism. And uh-huh. so, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can go about that fascinating, you know, for, for people who want to go that route where maybe at some places, you know, the, uh, on average, the minimum you'll get is a place to stay and food to eat as you contribute whatever it is that you're going to contribute. You know, and in some cases, you might make a little bit of money, you know, but for the most part, you know, you're at least going to get your room and board taken care of. And I think, you know, what's the idea of retiring when you have opportunities like that to explore the world, take out your talents, see where they can be used, and you're going to be fed to have a place to stay. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that, is, that is one way to do it. And mm-hmm. in our case, for instance, in uh, Cambodia, we hadn't even given it any thought. And our, uh, we were in an area uh, of, it was kind of a mm-hmm. poverty sort of area, and there was a big sign over this well. 
and it was donated by some family in California. So we asked our guide about it, and he said, oh, yeah, a lot of times people will come, and, and when they see how, uh, how the Cambodians live, then they want to donate money to, to build a well. And we said, okay, how much would that be? It's like $200. And, and so we said we want to do that. So he took us to an area where um, they actually do donate land to the disabled and to the extreme poor in, in, uh, in this was Siem Reap. And we picked out a, a, a plot, and it was very near three or four different um, um, families where they were living. To call them houses is way overstating it. Mm-hmm. They're you know, more like huts or whatever. And, and we picked out a spot, and that's where they built the well. And when we, uh, when we got home, Shortly after that, because they got right on it, our guide emailed us pictures of the well and the family standing around it, and they had put a sign up with our names on it, and the guide insisted that we do that, have a sign, because it helps other people to see and donate. And uh, they spelled my husband. My husband's name is John, and they spelled his name the Cambodian way, (laughs) (laughs) J-H-O-N. (laughs) J-H-O-N. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of makes more sense in some ways. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it does actually. So, yeah. but those are things that you can find when you travel, especially if you have a really good guide who is uh, tied into his into his uh, homeland and mm-hmm. into his people and all. He he will know what kind of things you can do that are legit. I mean, there, there's nothing against donating to organizations like Red Cross or you know whatever, um, but you know that it's getting straight to the people who need it when you're in a condition like right. that and you're standing there going, here's my $200, put a well right there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know that your money went fully to the building of that well and you know it's going to benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, it was like three or four families. So, You know, that's so, <clears throat> that's so true, too, Ann, because I remember uh, uh, when I was talking with Suzanne Summers, and uh, as she was talking about her book, Breakout, uh, which was about, you know, the natural ways that you can go about perhaps healing cancer. And she says one of the, <clears throat> that she's approached all the time by people in cancer organizations to basically lend her celebrity to their cause. And she says, I don't do this because, for one thing, millions of dollars have been raised by these organizations, but the thing is, a lot of people really don't know where that money goes or what it's used for. And she says, right. you would think after all these years of all this money they've raised, we'd be closer to a cure or something, and we're not. And so, Absolutely. you know, you hit it right on the head, you know, yeah, sure, go ahead and do these organizations, you know, the Christian Children's Fund, whatever the case is. But when you go and you actually do it, you can sleep at night knowing this is exactly where it went. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're looking at the people that are benefiting from it. I mean, they were following us around and thanking us and bowing. And, I mean, it almost made me feel bad because it's like, you know, I'm I'm not that great. This is not that big a deal. You know, right. dollars is a utility bill, mm-hmm. and it's the least I can do kind mm-hmm. of thing. So, mm-hmm. But it really, just something that simple can so impact lives. And it's the, the kind of thing that I think we should, we who are so fortunate to live where we do. Um, when we also are even more fortunate that we can travel and see the rest of the world, I think we should leave something behind if we mm. can. And if nothing more to realize the fact that you don't have to bake a cake with an oven that's powered by a propane tank. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> because the... Uh, Right, you know, halfway through it, as you mentioned, you know, the propane runs out, and all of a sudden your cake yep. turns into a brownie, and that's how we'll serve it, was it up. It brownies. That's right. <laughs> but my friends liked it as brownies, so mm-hmm. that was okay. <laughs> Funny stuff. Well, Ann, we want to thank you for being here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Is there a website people can find out more about this? Yes. Uh, the website actually is walkingnakedintehran.com, mm-hmm. and uh, you can buy my book there. Um, you can actually buy it anywhere. It's on Amazon and, and uh, all the e-readers and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, there is a website, walkingnakedintehran.com. It's always a wonderful pleasure to have people like yourself who come on and share magnificent life stories about how a lot of us who may be hitting a midlife crisis should muster up the courage to simply go out there and do what we've always dreamed. That you said the thing that you feared the most were the things that you didn't do rather than the things that you did. And there are so many of us that maybe get to that point halfway through our lives and realize 
geez, the biggest regrets I have are the things that I haven't done yet. And you certainly said through your book, Walking Naked in Tehran, it's about time you did something about it. We want to thank you for being here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Daniel, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it, and I enjoy talking to you. Thank you. We also thank you, the listeners, to find out more about this. Be sure to visit us at beyond50radio.blogspot.com. We'll have a hot link there where you can find out what your experience will be like as you begin walking naked in Tehran. You just simply, again, visit beyond50radio.blogspot.com, and you'll find out more about that. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past.